Rebecca. Hi, Megan. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to finally meet you, too. We've done some emailing, and we've done a lot of writing about each other back and forth, but, but we've and, never and actually spoken before. And a lot of reading your before. work even when I'm not writing it. What? I said, and a lot of reading your work even when I'm not writing about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've, I read your work every day. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you on the phone. Absolutely. So I guess if we're going to start off talking about women in the elections, we should probably touch on the debate, which was last night for us, although when people are seeing this, it'll be just a little bit later. Yes, last night. This is all anybody can talk about today, because it was it was about 12 hours ago that everybody sort of sat down with their pizza or their Thai food um, and <laughs> watched the long-awaited vice presidential debate. Um, do you want to sort of... I mean, you want to talk about what impressions were, both where you watched it and then what you've gathered this morning? Well, I mean, my impression when I watched it is that she came out in a very competitive way that, you know, seems to be very much what people said was her personality type at the time um, when she was first elected, which is to say that she's a very competitive person. And I think to a degree, maybe that's why that didn't translate to interviews, because, of course, interviews aren't supposed to be competitive. You're not supposed to be hammering back at your interviewer. And instead, you know, she came out very forcefully, you know, in, in a very typical way, I think, for how you saw her act at the Republican convention and how you saw her speak when she was first nominated. And I think it's one of the few times she's been able to recapture that. Right. I think, uh, you know, I think it's interesting that you say that it was a matter of style that didn't come across in her interviews with Katie Couric, because my my imaginative vision of what happened, and I don't think it's a stretch, obviously she was coached within an inch of her life for this debate. Um, I don't know about the tra- her own personal transition from having done those Katie Couric interviews or the Charlie Gibson interviews or the Hannity um, interviews to doing the debate. I don't know when, what went on in her head and whether it was a difference in style, but I know that so much of what I saw last night was like you could practically see the practice drills, you know, and the the words she wanted to hit on. I mean, the the moves that she made. And by the way, I'm not really being critical when I'm saying this. I mean, I think she hit a lot of the marks that she was trained for, you know. If she were an Olympic ice skater, she got the triple axles on a couple of on a couple of occasions. Um, but you could practically hear the practiced, uh, there were the, the phrases, a lot of people are talking about the folksiness, they're like, well, gosh darn, and doggone it, there you go again, Joe. I mean, you could you could practically hear a week's worth of practice of, well, there you go again, Joe, you know, getting its big chance in the spotlight. And, and so I think in that respect, everybody gets, everybody gets trained for a debate. She got tr- trained this week, especially after her um, dismal performances with Katie Couric, especially hard. And she, she came out and she hit her marks. That said, I think it did sound very practiced. And I think we should talk about the folksy factor and how that washed with viewers. Well, and I, I think the, the folksy factor was an attempt, at least on the people that were coaching her, to take advantage of what is to a degree, or seems to a degree, to be her speaking style and seem to have been effective for her in the Alaska debate. But as a way to sort of segue between talking points, which I think is a lot of what she memorized, you could almost see her lining up the cue cards, and I, it seems like that was their way of trying to get her to make effective segues in a way that she wasn't doing in her interview with Katie Couric in a way that I don't think actually worked last night because it it just became these horrible kind of run-on sentences where there wasn't a segue between items, let alone when she insisted on turning everything back to energy policy. Right. Well, that was clearly, I mean, the the turn of everything back to energy policy, I don't know if it was you who wrote this morning that, you know, if she wanted to be energy secretary, she should have spoken up earlier. Um, (laughs) That was me. (laughs) Yeah, it was a good line. Um, I I also, I wish I could take credit for this. This is actually a line my friend uh, emailed me this morning that she thought that she stopped just short of pulling out her wallet and showing her baby pictures, you you know, in terms of the way that she used, um, as you're saying, the sort of, the segues back to comfortable territory, energy, or, um, you know, the fact that she's part of a team of mavericks, which was totally my favorite part of the entire debate was the notion of the team of mavericks. Um, it's like a fraternity or sorority, you know, in which everybody's a maverick. Um, 
And There's got to be some sports team called that somewhere in this country. We should go. They should get hired by Palin Biden to like you know cheer at the rallies or something. Oh, exactly. Well, you know, I heard last night on a listserv that I was on, people were keeping track of of Cafe Press. And, you know, T-shirts that were becoming available on Cafe Press sort of in real time. I don't know whether it was a joke or not, but this idea that already around the country, Team of Mavericks T-shirts were being sold. Um, but but I do think that she really did, in those in the segues, in the, and you could hear it from that first answer. I mean, there was this collective groan in the living room where I was watching it. The very first answer, which was, well, I think the way that you judge what's going on in the economy is you go to a soccer game and talk to the people sitting around on the sidelines. I mean, she just, every single answer was going to be prefaced with a folks, you know, a, a, some kind of uh, colloquialism or I'm just regular like you, um, and then go into whatever she wanted to talk about. And the, one of the two key points for me, um, that were, I believe, real failures on her part, um, were where she absolutely couldn't take it anymore and finally just said, in as, in as likable and affable a way as possible, but she finally just said, well, I'm not going to answer the questions of my opponent or of the moderator. And it was, she was trying to pull it off, um, and I guess, it's, I guess you could say something for her that she was making an attempt to make it blend in with the rest of her demeanor. Um, but she was clearly... Uh, at that point just backed into a corner and needed to say, well, screw you, Gwen Eiffel. Um, I'm not going to answer the question. And the fact that she had to that she had to come out and say, literally, I am not responding to the questions you're asking, um, I thought that was a real loss of composure, even though it wasn't a temper tantrum and she was still managing to keep it in her own vernacular. I thought it was a real loss of control. Um, the other moment that I thought was a really grim failure was her response to Biden's uh, getting choked up. And, uh, you know, because th- since her whole shtick is, you know, the way you learn about America is you go and you talk to the people about their experiences. Um, and here is her opponent um, who... who uh, practically began to cry talking about his own family um, and his own experiences. And her response to that it seemed to be a moment of panic because according to her character, her personality, her response to that should have been, well, Joe, I'm so sorry. You know, this is exact, you know, this, this kind of story, I, I, I understand it's tragic and I feel for your family. But instead, what she did was launch into an almost robotic disquisition on how she and John McCain are mavericks. And didn't even engage with with somebody on stage who was offering a real show of human emotion, and I thought that was a huge failure because it really put the big crack in the in the why well, just care about regular people um, and the experiences that they go through facade. So, well, and, yeah, and I feel given all the things you you saw her talk about and her you know special needs child and her family, and, and it would have been a great opportunity for her to have said you know, something about her own family's problems and to have sort of made that connection and brought it back to what, as you pointed out, I think rightly, had been her segue into every answer that she gave to questions that weren't being asked. Um, And instead, she just sort of launched into her final speech. And I think actually, to a degree, that's a huge failure of the coaching because, you know, as as, as much as you see, I think, um, of uh, people poorly coached in debates, and, and in my mind, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend comes to mind because anytime I saw her interviewed um, before the election for the governor of Maryland that she lost to Bob Ehrlich, she had five talking points. And any question that she was asked in any interview that she ever gave, she re- reiterated one of those five talking points. And I think you know, you can only say the same thing so many times over and over again before people that aren't that experienced with politics look at it and go, don't you have anything else to say? Can't you speak about the issues that are important to me without having a speechwriter write it for you? And I think, you know, that's how it came across, that, that the folksy thing is great if it comes across as really genuine. I think, not for me, I mean, personally, I looked at it and I was like, oh, God, stop. But right. <laughs> I think it plays really well in... In, in small towns and rural areas in the Midwest where people aren't loving the way that senators speak, and, and there was a lot of criticism about that in some of the focus groups that I was reading today, but at the same time, if you can't come across as genuine during the folksy thing, which I think until now she really has, I think this is the first time that I, I, I have to agree with you that, that the folksy facade came off, that, she, that it became obvious that it was to a great degree a very scripted thing. I mean... Right, it's a performance, the, and it looked like a performance last night. I mean... And that was, it was those breaks. And, and the fact, 
I mean, it, it reminds me of some comedy sketch I once saw. I think actually the comedy sketch was something I saw when I was a kid, and it was about Ronald Reagan, and, and sort of in retelling it, I'm going to muddle it. But it was about Ronald Reagan, and halfway through it showed his battery dying, you know, and him yeah. sort of petering out halfway through. And, and you know, the joke, which I thought was hilarious as an 8-year-old, or however I was when I saw this, was that he was, a, you know... A robot, a puppet, it was a performance, it wasn't authentic. And I think that there were moments last night, um, many moments, where Palin's performance as the queen of just folksiness really came across as a performed thing. Um, I think one of those, frankly, was her opening, talking about going to the soccer field. I know. Um, I, wasn't she a hockey ball? Well, did I did I not hear that like fifteen times? So, do her kids play? I mean, didn't she, in fact, in her RNC speech, say something about not being a soccer mom, being a hockey mom instead? So, when is she going to the soccer field? That was obviously like a very scripted thing. I think somebody told her, her that soccer, soccer was a more was a more national nationally accepted. The soccer moms might be, you know, she might need to work in some soccer love or something. I'm sure that somebody somebody I, tried I to convince her to bring up soccer. something that real Americans didn't do. What, what happened to football? Like, can she go to, like, a football game? She has right. to. So, uh, I mean, she has a son that's going off to college, but I mean, that to me was, was the moment why, the first moment when she opens with that, I went, oh, that's kind of a mistake because you had someone write that. And it was a good line and it was a good, I mean, it was a good story. Although I, I have to say, like, you shouldn't have to this week go to a soccer game to figure out that we have economic problems in this yeah, country. I know. I that know. was my reaction. I was like, just now, you're just figuring out now <laughs> that we have economic problems in this country, like the whole subprime crisis going on for a couple of years, interest rates in decline, unemployment on the rise, you know, inflation on the rise. But well, you know, well, you that, went to a soccer game and you heard about it. Well, that's the fine line in the in the regular people shtick, and I think that's something to really consider. And it's something that I thought about earlier this week with her statement about. Um, when Katie Kirk had asked her about not having a passport, and she'd said, well, you know, not like a lot of people in this country, I wasn't handed a passport and a backpack, and, um, you know, I had to work two jobs. I, I think that that, that and y- y- your example of the, the soccer story and how really people only understand the economy at a soccer game are two examples of where you can really, really cross a dangerous line in the trying to talk to and like just regular folks, which is, it is extraordinarily valid and important that politicians speak to, believe me, speak to poverty and to class difference and to the opportunities that are in front of some Americans and not in front of others. I don't want to diminish the value of recognizing that there are so many different versions of opportunity in this country. um, And and most of them are incredibly limited. So Sarah Palin, uh, talking to people who don't have some of the privileges um, that that other people have is is a perfectly um, reasonable idea. The problem is she does not, there is that line where suddenly it's like, oh, there's condescension here. What she was essentially saying with that was, I didn't have opportunities and I didn't... (sighs) I, there was a and lack I didn't of need them. What? Basically, I mean that's what she's saying is I didn't have the opportunities and I didn't need them. I mean, a great way to attack that question is is frankly to go after what everyone agrees is a really crappy Bush administration policy, which is the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, which for the first time, you know, a year and a half ago forced a ton of Americans to get passports to go to places like Canada, which say Alaska borders, or what? Puerto Rico, or places like that where you didn't not Puerto Rico, I'm sorry, the some of the other islands in the Caribbean. But that's a huge thing and that didn't sit well with a lot of Republicans. Republicans, and it would be the sort of thing where she could, you know, point, take another moment to point out her maverick thing, and instead she makes it about this class thing, as though only us East Coast elitist people and West Coast elitist people ever go to Europe on a backpacking trip. I mean, right, and that the lack of that the lack of curiosity that she displayed. I mean, there are a, a hell of a lot of people out there who work multiple jobs, who do not have opportunities, but who take what is available to them. And, and pursue, they, they have interests, they have curiosity, they pick up a paper, they learn about their country, they learn about the government. This is, and, and the, the general lack of interest, knowledge, curiosity she displayed in her sets of, of interviews this 
these past two weeks. And also, I would say, in the debate, her ability to talk on one or two subjects and that's it, and not have any interest in talking about anything else, or any ability to talk about anything else, is actually a major disservice to those people who come from, um, who, who maybe do have limited opportunities, but who are energized and engaged in what's in what's going on in their country, what's going on in other countries. It really, it, it represents those people very badly. Um, and I think that well, that... I mean, for me, I actually worked two jobs in order to afford to go study abroad, which, by the way, even though I went to a liberal East Coast university, because I didn't have a lot of money, I traveled with a group of students from the University of Kansas, most of whom were from small towns in the Midwest and from Kansas. And so, you know, to call those people sort of East Coast elitist is, A, funny to me, but that's what I put my money towards because that's what I was studying in school and that was what was sort of important for my education and for my own intellectual curiosity to spend time in another country in a very short period of time, which was going to be my only opportunity. The number of students at public universities, at private universities across this country studying abroad has skyrocketed. And it's not this elitist opportunity that it was, I guess, at some point in the past. It's something that is almost not a standard part of the university experience, and certainly the university experience isn't standard in this country, but that's a thing a lot of people do. And so to say that, you know, you didn't get handed a backpack or a passport, I mean, to me, I didn't get handed a backpack or a passport. I worked right. two jobs the summer before. I worked three jobs the right. year before, and I spent a summer, you know, spending all the money that I had in my possession studying in Europe, like learning another language, learning another history, you know, going places, visiting museums, you know, great. So thanks, Sarah Palin. Um, <laughs> got to know my parents just handed me a backpack and sent me off when they didn't have the money to afford to pay for me to go to college. Right, anyway. well, right. well, this is the line. This is the line between um, sort of straight talk and condescension. And I think that's a lot of what we saw last night, the sort of winking and, well, people understand the economy by going, you know, when you talk to them at soccer games. Well, you know what? A lot of people out there, people who do go to soccer games or football games or hockey games or who don't, they understand the economy in a lot of different ways. They also understand it from reading the papers. They also understand it having conversations at their jobs and with their friends and with their colleagues. And this assumption that everything can be boiled down to this, like, common Saturday afternoon experience that we all have is, in fact, I think, um, really selling a huge number of Americans very, very short intellectually and politically. Um, so well, I, mean, I don't think most people that have retirement accounts. I mean, my parents yes. have, you know, retirement accounts. My father just retired. These aren't people that woke up a week ago and went, oh, shit, my 401K's gone. I mean, my the stock that, you know, my parents gave me as a graduation gift that's part of their retirement package, that's been tanking for two years. I mean, that's actually technically been tanking for almost 10 since they gave it to me. Yes. But it's been on a decline, and it's been on a long decline, and it's basically dropped in half in the last three months. It's not the last week. It's the last three months. So people that have retirement accounts, people that have pension programs that are invested in retirement accounts, people that a lot of baby boomers that are on the verge of retirement, like my parents are, are looking at it and not go, not finding out about this week. They're finding out about it a month ago. They're finding out it two weeks ago. This whole, the fundamentals of the economy are the American worker. Well, which worker is going to pay for my parents to have their retirement money back? It's not going to happen. Right. Like, and also, you know, my parents get to be American workers for another 10 years, maybe, to be able to afford to retire. So, you know, the fundamentals of the economy being the American worker. You no, know, fundamentals of the economy are like inflation and things like that that are actually going to affect my parents' ability to retire before the age of 70 and enjoy their golden years together. Right. And let's not even talk about the variety of Americans who've had their homes foreclosed on who probably would have known that there are economic problems and have felt the fear of which Sarah Palin spoke before they attended the Saturday soccer game. I mean, this is the kind of, like... The idea that everybody's, you know, happy clappy on a on a soccer field and they're feeling feeling fear. Well, people have been feeling fear and a lot worse for a long time now. <laughs> well, and and if you have, I mean, not to be rude, but to play after school sports like that or to play in or you know outside of school sports like that, that costs money. Yes. There's going to be a lot of families that have been foreclosed upon that. You know that have these fears, but they have these fears. They don't. They don't get to go to the soccer field because they, you know, they can't afford the hundred dollars or the two hundred dollars extra out of their budget because their mortgage has gone up, their adjustable rate went up, their house is being foreclosed upon, their bills are up. They've got ten thousand dollars or eighteen thousand dollars in credit card debt to try to make ends meet, and they're going to bankruptcy court. Like these are not, you know, great. So you have people that are still able to provide those things for your kids, but you also have people that are legitimately like in dire straits. And I, I agree with you. I think this. 
that that the lack of knowledge that she has about a lot of things, you know, she can claim to be middle class and and, and all these things, but two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm sorry, is not middle class. Median income in this country is forty seven thousand dollars for a, a household, not just no, not just for a single person. You're not talking one person's salary. You're not. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm median in- income, but I also live by myself. Like that's you're talking forty seven thousand for you know your average for a family. typical family of four. Yes, that's that's median income. That's middle class. Like, well, one of know, the things we were fifty thousand dollars is rich. One of the things we were discussing uh, where I was watching the debate last night, at, which was in my home with some friends, um, was how apparently, and this is this goes for both Joe Biden and Sarah Palin, and this was true in the presidential debate too. I'm wondering why people there's no conversation about poverty in this country. Everybody talks about the middle class, and it's as if poor people do not exist. And this I found so troubling. Did you notice that? That there's, whenever we talk about money, we're no longer addressing, I mean, yes, the point about the $47,000 for a family, yes, that is middle class. But, But there's absolutely no discussion of what we do with the people who don't make that. Who never, well, I mean, who never you know, qualified to increase the minimum wage to five and a quarter. What? I said they increased the minimum wage to five and a quarter. Didn't you know they solved poverty? Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I would agree. Like you don't, you don't see that. I mean, basically, not to to bring up ghosts of democratic races past, but since since John Edwards dropped out of the race, you really haven't seen this discussion. And I, I think, frankly, it has to do a lot with voter participation. You know, who votes in elections? Rich people vote in elections. You know, people that eighty percent of this country. If you ask people, eighty percent of this country will tell you that they are middle class. Well. That's not that's not even like the middle quartile. That's not like the middle twenty percent that you could legitimately say are middle class. I mean, you're talking eighty percent of this country. You're talking everybody thinks that they are middle class. And so what they're doing by saying that is they're appealing to people that make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and think that they are middle class. And they're appealing to people that make thirty five thousand dollars a year and think, and think that they are middle class. And the difficulty is is those are the people that vote all the more the two hundred fifty thousand people. So. You don't talk about poverty because, you know... Nobody wants to identify as being impoverished. Oh, well, and, and not only does no one want to identify as being impoverished, but the people that do don't vote regularly. That's why you see drives going on, like with the Salvation Army, to register right. homeless people. That's why you see voter registration drives going on in communities. But that's also, I think, why you see things like what's going on in Michigan and in Florida with voter caging and getting, you know, the list, lists of names of foreclosed upon people to get them kicked off the rolls because there is a... Whether it's true or not, and I, I think to some degree statistically it is borne out, there's an idea that poor people vote Democratic. So, right. Well, there's also, but there is another aspect to this, and maybe I'm just being naive here, but, um, you know, even if you're not, even if you're not trying to address homeless people based on the assumption that homeless people aren't going to vote, isn't there any sense anymore that, that what we do as a country for our most unfortunate Citizens uh, who have some of the biggest challenges ahead of them should matter to the other citizens. You know, I mean, I think that's part of what I'm getting at, is that um, the assumption that I, as a voter, and that and that other voters around the country are only. I mean, this again, I'm being naive, and I am being, uh, uh, you know, sort of. But deliberately naive, and it's cute. It's fine. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said de- at deliberately naive, but it. I mean, it's fine. I think it's an important discussion to have, even it if just, it requires that we. Uh, yeah, no, I know it requires that we stretch. But John Edwards, I mean, John Edwards had a strong following of people who who they th- themselves were probably not, um, you know, lower class or, or below the poverty line, but of people who cared what he was talking about when he was talking about poverty and class. And that just seems to have fallen. I don't think it has to be um, addressing only people who are in those circumstances. I think that there can be um, the hope, at least, that that middle class people also care what's happening to the country as a whole, what, what's happening to people who are severely disadvantaged. Um, and there just seems to be none of that anymore. It's just the assumption that you're only listening to hear when they address you about, oh, is that my income bracket? What's going to happen to me tax-wise? What's going to happen to me? And, my, and, and that sort of depressed me last night. Um, I also, I, I, this is sort of, might be a funny transition, but I do want to talk about another aspect of what we saw last night um, that's very close to... But before to we get there, I mean, I just want to say, I mean, from my perspective, I think the way that class is being talked about is being talked about in terms of much more of issues than just class itself or poverty itself. It's talking about 
the forty-seven million uninsured Americans. It's talking right. about Healthcare the importance the, right. of yeah changing affirmative action programs to recognize that a lot of disadvantagement comes from poverty, which which may or may not be long-term poverty, which may or may not be, which is related to class because or related to race because more proportionally more pe- more minorities are poor than proportionally white people are poor, but I think, you know, that's the way it's being talked about because I think it has a broader appeal. And I, so, I, I mean, that's the way that I see it going, that I see the campaigns going after it, or I, I think I should be fair, Barack Obama's campaign, I don't think John McCain on health care really does anything for poor people. But back to what you were saying. Well, and talking about education. I mean, th- those yeah. are some of the, and that's, those are the issues that actually at the end of, of the Clinton primary race that she was sort of, when she was on on her, um, she was beginning to talk about some issues of class and, and addressing the working class. And I think the Obama campaign also has picked, has has taken that and um, I wouldn't say run with it. I don't think Clinton was running with it either. But um, it certainly is more present in 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 what Obama's talking about. Um, the the thing that I was going to address that actually has nothing to do with this is does feel like sort of an awkward transition. But one of the things I considered last night was the the level of traditional femininity on display in that vice presidential debate. And a stereotype, uh, I think, of traditional femininity. What I said, I said I would call it more of a stereotype of traditional femininity than actual traditional femininity. Oh, say. oh, yes, certainly. That's what I mean. I, I wasn't suggesting that it was any kind of authentic or, <laughs> um, but, but I was just amazed. I think I'm remembering this right. And you know, this is the kind of thing I should have looked up and gotten it exactly right. But I, I'm fairly sure that it was in the vice presidential debate that Geraldine Ferraro was asked if um, the Soviet Union would consider. America weak if it had a female vice president. And yeah. where she basically had to slough off any uh, traces of femininity. Um, this is, you know, <laughs> Sarah Palin has inherited her, her her legacy here, and she is, she's got her baby up after, you know, within half, you know, 30 seconds of the debate being over, she is holding that newborn, which was actually a really arresting image for me. I was so surprised. I I couldn't get over how surprised I was, um, given how much I think about gender and politics, and I was still taken aback to see the candidate um, holding an infant within a minute of the debate's conclusion. Um, But there was also focus, relentless focus, on um, her role as a mother, on kids, on, on her sort of, yes, as you say, stereotyped traditional girliness. Um, and I just want to talk about uh, what do we think what do we think all this means? Well, and I, I mean on one degree, like I, I think it's sort of positive because I think when Geraldine Farrar was asked that, she was asked basically, you know, to be the new not to get all literary on this here, but to be the new Lady Macbeth, you know, de-sex yourself, unsex yourself to be in power. And I think that that has been a sort of very stereotypical idea of women in powerful positions, that you have to be as mannish, if not more. And I think you you can see examples of that in the way that Madeleine Albright was, say, portrayed as more hawkish than the administration that she worked for. And, you, you know, the way in which Hillary Clinton was sort of negatively portrayed because she wasn't, you know, a politician necessarily at the time she was, a, quote, unquote, a politician's wife you know, as not feminine enough because you're supposed to be feminine if you're a wife, but you're not supposed to be feminine at all if you're a leader. And I think, right. you know, fast forward 25 years, you know, 24 years from Geraldine Farrar and 20 years almost from Hillary Clinton, you know, taking the national stage. And, you, you know, you have a much a much different way that women are sort of interacted with. You have women like Nancy Pelosi, who is the Speaker of the House, but also, you know, promotes her role as wife, mother, grandmother, and, and dresses And who wears very dramatic scarves. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and can be pretty and be powerful, because I don't, you know, she is a, she's a very striking woman for, you know, frankly, a woman of her age. If I look that great when I'm her age, I would be super happy. Um, but, you know, and so and you see women like Ellen Tauscher, who was just chairing, you know, the bailout hearing, who's, who's also very powerful and a former stockbroker, and she's chairing the financial bailout hearing, but she always looks very impeccable. And you see the sort of movement towards being able to incorporate your femininity into your position of power. So on that level, 
I'm sort of really happy about it that I don't have to, you know, chop my hair and, and, and dress in a very boxy suit and, and not be a woman at the office as much that I can, you know, not that I go to an office now, but, you know, that I can wear a skirt suit and I can wear heels and I can wear, you know, a jacket nipped in at the waist and, you know, allow my breasts to be, you know, at least, you know, visible and not, you know, ace bandage them down. I mean, I, I still, <laughs> you know, I mean, I still remember this, this scene in Cheers where um, B.B. Newworth, this is very old, I'm totally really my age, B.B. Newworth takes um, Kirstie, um, Kirsti, yeah, not Kirstie, yeah, yeah, under her wing and says, I'm going to make you out to be a better businesswoman. And she shows up, she's right. got this very wide shoot and she's, you know, strapped her breast down so she's basically flat chested and she's got this very severe hairstyle. And that was sort of the archetype of the powerful woman in the 80s. So on that level, I'm really happy to see that gone. And on the other level, I'm not as happy with the way that Sarah Palin has sort of made it about being almost flirtatious with a crowd, about the winking and the hair tossing and the, the, the cutesy part of it. I mean, you can be a feminine woman and be powerful, but for me, I wonder, you know, I mean, you can you look at Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice is not cutesy. Right. She well, is a strong, powerful, feminine-looking woman, but she is not cutesy, and I am okay with that. I think you look at Sarah Palin, and she's, you know, tossing her hair, and she's, you know, nodding her head, and she's almost kind of giggling, and, you know, her voice gets sort of very higher-pitched, and not that I'm not doing that now as I speak, but her voice gets pitched, and she, you know, sort of ends on a little bit of an upswing on certain sentences, and in an effort to be sort of not just feminine, but cutesy feminine, some sort of archetype of the girl next door, even though she is on her own, in her own right, a very powerful female political leader. And that part of it, I agree with you, really bothered me last night. Well, it sort of seemed to me to be an example of, um, I have this argument, I've written about it a little bit, and it's just, you know, I, it just keeps growing in my mind, that that basically what Sarah Palin is and some has done in some ways, and not, not just Sarah Palin, um, but also the McCain campaign and, and its choice of Sarah Palin and the Republican Party and how it's dealt with her, um, has taken the progress of feminism and made it, like, turned it inside out and made it a grotesque bastardization of, feminiz of feminism. And I think that that was what I was thinking about last night. I was thinking about the trajectory of, for example, um, not not Hillary Clinton simply as first lady, but even just the Hillary Clinton primary campaign in which we saw, I think, her starting from a place where she was very eager to avoid being, um, being not being female, but being too feminine or being thought of as, as too feminine. She was coming at it from a very sort of de-sexed... Um, place, not nearly as bad as it used to be, but, but still, um, trying, her campaign at first was very allergic to talking about feminism. In fact, it remained allergic through the entire primary campaign to actually talking about feminism. Um, Mark Penn? Can we just say Mark Penn? Oh, I, that I was Mark Penn. I think that, I, mean, I just was, lost you. That was you. Mark Penn's, in, oh, sorry, that was Mark Penn's initiative, though. I mean, that oh, was yeah. his thing. Don't, I mean, which is kind of hilarious. As a dude, he was saying, be more like a dude. Right. And so... Well, that, but that was one of the great mistakes. One of the things we learned is that that was one of the great errors of the Clinton campaign. And and I think that though unfortunately she never lost Mark Penn, she did in the in the second and um, more successful uh, part of her campaign, and increasingly so at the very end, um, sort of become get more comfortable with being feminine, with being loose, with being um, flirty is not a word I. I I mean, quite literally, but, but, you know, maybe a little bit. She, and she really warmed up um, to her role as sort of a feminist folk hero, and that culminated, of course, with her concession speech, and then with the Denver speech, in which it was very, like, the, the video they showed before her Denver speech, I don't know if you remember this, but it was, it was basically like she came from a family made entirely of women, and she barely had a husband, and when, <laughs> when Clinton, when Bill Clinton spoke, it said Hillary's husband underneath. It was very, like, um woman power. And that went over like gangbusters. And I think that that represented, I mean, there, there are lots of arguments you can make about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I do think it represented a certain kind of progress, exactly what you were describing, that, that in order to succeed and be powerful, a woman no longer has to behave as though she's not female, um, you know, and it can, can make some, some um, movements toward a, toward a more um, accepted kind of femininity. 
But well, and a more what, holistic view of her personality too is is, is I don't think I think the caricatures of Hillary Clinton as sexless and and whatever were were very I, much a caricature that that no woman is any one thing. You know, all of us are. I mean, all of us are women in some way. All of us have some piece of that. And so I think what you saw by the end of the primary is when she got less scripted and less sort of under Mark Penn's thumb a little bit in terms of where his strategy is I'm having, I'm having that some she was real trouble more hearing you. Picture. Meg, okay. Megan, I'm having some real trouble hearing you. I couldn't hear what the last thing you said, what, what you just said was. Um, I, I said I, I thought that it was a more that, – that Hillary Clinton at the end of the primary was a more holistic Hillary Clinton, that no woman is any one given thing. Yes. That, that, that it wasn't just, you know, that, that she was sort of asexual before as much as she was portrayed, and that's why I think – at, by the end of the primaries, by her speech at the DNC, you were seeing sort of the whole person that she was, because right. none of us are any one kind of woman. Sure, right, and that that is that is I think and and is progressive, and I think that's what you were saying too. That that, that being able to be a whole person, man or woman, is is a, and not have to sort of strap down your your boobs or whatever, um, is progress. But but this version, the Sarah Palin version of doing that, which is my whole selling point is that I'm a girl in the most comfortable way you can imagine. Um, that to me is sort of that is making that kind of progress grotesque. Task. And that's what freaks me out. It's this idea that, like, the whole reason that I'm your candidate is because I'm a mom. Have you seen my five children? And because I, I love my husband. And because I'm flirty. And because I look hot. And because I, you know, all of these, all of these versions of femininity, which are, first of all, <laughs> just antiquated, <laughs> but also totally comfortable to an old and patriarchal vision of the sexes. Um, and I think that that is, I, I think that I this think is part of what's her. troubling about what we saw last night, which was this sort of parade of every feminine while you can possibly imagine, is that there's nothing progressive about it at all. I mean, I think what you were saying was... was um about Sarah, Sarah, sort of Sarah Palin's kind of stereotypical femininity and that you felt like it was turning feminism on its head and the sort of gains that we sort of made on, on their head and, and then you sort of cut out, so. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, 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 think, that, I think that the larger concern is that by taking what could be considered progress, which is um, allowing women to be full women um, even as they gain power, um, and actually turning that into encouraging women to be older and more comfortable versions of what uh, people think women should act like. Moms, flirty, hot, ladies who giggle a lot, or what, however you think of Sarah Palin's particular brand of femininity, um, is actually just taking the work that's been done um, not only by feminists, um, but by by women um, of every stripe, you know, who have who have um, made so much progress uh, in in recent years and and in recent decades, and just absolutely turning the meaning inside out, making it you know opposite day um, in terms I mean, of the I, women's I, rights movement. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I sort of feel you know that it's it, it's almost. In the same way that Hillary Clinton was sort of told to not be feminine by men that were concerned that by being too feminine she wouldn't be seen as a good leader, I almost feel like Sarah Palin is being told to a degree to, 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 to be this sort of stereotype of accessible femininity, that, to, that she shouldn't, you know, which is actually kind of funny because I think the, the parts of her speech at the RNC that went over best were, were when she was being hyper competitive and when she was, was out there hitting on people. I think that's what really spoke to Republicans. I mean, that's certainly what spoke to Republicans that were there that night. It wasn't right. this sort of hyper feminine kind of portrayal that she had last night. The best, the best things that she, that she did were to be this this sort of Sarah Barracuda, and then you have her sort of in these soft focus and these pink suits and the higher necklines, and you, you have sort of a very different kind of Sarah Palin trying to be projected in these interviews, and I think quite unsuccessfully. Um, you know, so I, I sort of, on the one hand, like I, I wonder how much of that is her actual public persona, given 
her sort of what what I sort of see is this very competitive streak in her nature, which I think sort of comes out when she's, you know, down in effect. Right. Um, with with how much she's being asked to portray a more accessible portray, as you said, a more accessible idea of femininity, and I don't I don't think that it's actually ending up being more successful because I think you can you know be a mother. I think all candidates, sort of especially these days, are out there as parents and look at my sort of successful family. And I think you know a lot of candidates that can't show that, whether that be you know, Jeb Bush or Rudy Giuliani or, or other, you know, who, who have kids that are maybe a little screwed up, who have, you know, family issues or multiple divorces or things like that, that, that a lot of Americans simply don't identify with in some way, which is sad because I think every family has their own problems. But, right. um, you know, that they've sort of, when every candidate goes and does these things, um, other people are are sort of watching in a very strange way. So I, I I sort of feel like that Sarah Palin is is um, she is portraying this sort of hyper femininity, but I, I I think you know if it could be balanced with more kind of intelligence about how they are actually putting her out there, you know I think when she's talking about energy policy because it is obviously a subject she's very comfortable with, she she sounds smart, she sounds like she knows what she's talking about, and rather than you know, and, and my joke about asking her to be energy secretary this morning, you know, wasn't wasn't really a joke. She sounds right. good. I mean, I don't agree with what she's saying, right. but she sounds good. Um, but I think, you know, that it that it makes it very difficult for people to um, to respond to that when you have this sort of hyper femininity, sort of coupled with this obvious lack of knowledge on certain subjects, whether that be foreign policy or a willingness to talk about the mortgage crisis or whatever it is. Right. Well, I think that that's actually, I think the contrast is not so much Sarah Barracuda versus the flirty fun girl who we saw last night. Um, I think the contrast is the way she can talk about, she can talk about energy versus, and again, I disagree with her on energy completely. However, um, you know, she's got a brain, she's, for that, I mean, she's, she has the facts. It's not even, I, 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 by the way, I want to be really careful. I, I don't mean to question her, her intelligence, um, I do question her preparedness, readiness, knowledge, and, you know, um, her education on lots of other topics. So I don't mean to say, when I, when I said something about, you know, she's got a brain for energy, doesn't mean she doesn't have a brain for other things. It means that in other areas, I think she just is incredibly ill-informed. So I think that's the, that is actually the contrast, because the Sarah Barracuda is another form of um, sort of uh, hoary old stereotypes of, of femininity. Um, it's the sneering mean girl version. The Sarah Barracuda is actually the kind of thing that can only be pulled off if you're a woman or, or maybe Rudy Giuliani. Um, you know, that kind of like, oh, you're a community organizer. Or I know Joe Biden, he was giving, he was giving speeches when I was in second grade. I mean, those are also her toughness, the places where she really attacks. Um, are also a version of uh, of a kind of accepted um, vision of what it means to be a particular kind of girl. I think the contrast really comes with, for example, when she's talking about energy. Um, you know, or well, to a degree... And, and, and I mean, I think, you know, you know, intellectual curiosity is its own kind of intelligence. I think, you know, it's... Yes, she was only a governor, but I don't think, as a governor you don't have any experience on foreign policy or you don't know about it or you're not intellectually curious about it. I think you see in a lot of ways um, other governors, particularly, you know, you go back a couple of years and you have, like, Massachusetts put, trying to put economic sanctions on Burma and fighting it all the way to the Supreme Court. There are governors that are really engaged in foreign policy issues. I think there are governors that are really engaged in issues other than energy policy. I think there are governors that are you know, engaged on Supreme Court cases. I think, you know, you have a, a lot of, I mean, they're just, you know. I the, think that, that there are school teachers and <coughs> not, and bus drivers and, and plumbers and elevator operators and Wall Street business people who are more engaged and would be absolutely as qualified or more qualified for the role of vice president, um, than this particular governor. I think the experience is not about simply was she governor, was she mayor. Um, I think it's about how much you know, understand, and the level at which you think about the issues. 
Um, well, and I, I mean, for me, the level at which she thinks about the issues is, is actually a part of a lot of the problems that I see in a lot of those sort of mini scandals that have popped up around her in the last couple of weeks. I think from talking about her administration and, you know, cutting the $15,000 line item for rape kits in Wasilla, or if you go, you know, to the governor's level and this, you know, willingness to go to the mat to try to get, you know, basically her brother-in-law screwed over. Right. You know, these are not things, these do not seem to me to be things that are well thought through. Things have consequences. You know, issues have unintended consequences. And, and part of what you do as an effective legislator or an effective executive in a government is you try to think through what those unintentional consequences are. And I think, you know, you see that with the bailout plan. Everyone recognizes that on some level this is a sh- crappy bailout plan. It right. is not good. It's filled with pork. It's, you know, it's it's not necessarily going to address everything that needs to be addressed. It's, it doesn't cover regulation. It does give a lot of unfettered power to the Treasury. Right. And people are already saying, we're going to have a look at this in... January, in the same way that they went back and they looked at revisiting Starbanks Oxley, and they looked at, you know, unfortunately, they haven't really looked at revisiting FISA. They haven't looked at revisiting some of these other things, despite what I think are significant unintended consequences. And one of my concerns about Sarah Palin is that a lot of her actions as governor, a lot of her actions as mayor, had unintended consequences. You know, it's great to want to be a budget cutter. It's, a, I mean, I understand that's how Republicans win elections, and and, and obviously it's a very effective thing. I mean, you you saw. You know, three weeks ago, when they're hammering Barack Obama on taxes, that that his numbers started to slide because right. this whole tax and spend Democrat thing is just so drilled into us. You right. just never quite get away from it. But I, I feel like that's great. Let what are you going to cut in taxes, and what are you going to cut in spending, and are those the priorities of this country? You know, and I and I look at things like John McCain's health care plan, where I mean, I, I feel like I'm harping on this, but it's such a bad health care plan that. I'm just amazed, and, and so I'm not amazed that she didn't want to talk about it. I'm not amazed that she wanted to go talk about energy policy or wanted to go talk about something else or wanted to get Barack Obama on raising taxes. That's fine. I, I'm, right. I'm not surprised that she wanted to say universal health care. I'm surprised she didn't say Hillary care. But, no, you know, she, wants, she wants all the Hillary. She, she loves Hillary right now. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, the difficulty is is that, you know, this, the, the unintended consequences – by just saying, okay, we're going to get rid of the employer preference for health insurance. If they give it to you, we're going to charge it to you, charge you taxes on it as part of your salary. We're going to give you a $5,000 tax credit to cover it, and that's going to be the end of the day. Well, great. Uh, 40% of this country doesn't pay any federal income taxes. Right. Like, yes, they pay Social Security. Yes, they pay Medicare. You know, they get a lot of refunds at the end of the year. At the end of the day, 40% of people in America don't pay in federal income taxes. So where's that tax credit going to come out of? That's right. why... You know, the EITC is a refundable tax credit because the people that need it don't pay any taxes to refund to them but at the end of the year. So, for, you know, how many of the 47 million uninsured people in this country are in that 40% of Americans that don't pay any taxes? And I'm going to guess here, wild guess, a lot of them. But let so me ask you something. F- Do you think she understands everything you just said? No. I, I guarantee. I, I don't think the McCain understand. Campaign in general understands everything I just said. I don't think Douglas Holt Eakin has thought this through. I mean, I've heard him. I understand that that McCain's health care plan is Douglas Holt Eakin's tax care, tax plan. I, you know, I've I've worked on tax policy issues. Like I, I understand where Douglas Holt Eakin wants to go with this. Right. Where he wants to go with the inefficiencies of the health care system. Where he wants to go with you know lowering. Um, getting rid of the employer preference because it's supposed to have good market consequences down the line. I get that. I, I, I'm not opposed to that in theory. The problem is that theory is not reality. That if the only change you make to this health care system that we have in this country today is you get rid of every single employer's incentive to offer it to people, which is where most of the country, if they have it, gets it. Right. Where are people going to get health care from and how are you going to be able to go out and market? You can't just say, well, great. We're all of a sudden going to have 260 more, you know, or 200 million more people in the individual market on the state level, which I think everyone also agrees that the state level, uh, you know, insurance regulation is messed up and not equivalent across state lines. And you can get vastly different health insurance plans, and you and you can't get certain things that you may or may not need depending on what state you're in. So it's great to say all those things. I would, you know, and I understand where it is, but I, the unintended consequences of going down that path in a really quick way of, of going next year and saying, okay, as part of 
a tax reform package that everyone knows is coming as part of the health care program that McCain Palin promised. We're going to eliminate the employer preference for health care, and they're going to give it to people back as a tax credit, and then the market will work itself out. The right, because the market does so beautifully, out. especially when you remove the regulations. So then when you remove, you know, when you deregulate the health care and leave it to the market to drive, you know, we can see. Exa- I don't know why Biden didn't make a bigger deal out of, out of, I, I, there were th- some things that I wished, I thought Biden was great last night, but this conversation is one that in not quite these terms, I wish that he had pursued more thoroughly last night. Did you feel well, the same no, way? I mean, I think he, I, 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 I think he did hit on, I actually think that given, you know, the, the two minute time frame, given the 30 second time right. frame, the way that he explained the, the, the problems, the very serious problems that anybody that like actually pays attention to the healthcare market as opposed to the tax issues of it. You know, but the way he explained it was perfect. It it spoke to, I think, real Americans that can go that, that don't pay attention. Most people don't right. ever know how much their company is paying on their behalf unless, like me, they get laid off or fired all the time. I right. get laid off and fired all the time. So I know <laughs> what COBRA costs. Right. You know, I know that the last time that I was laid off from my job, $450 a month. I don't think I, I mean, that's, that right there, $450 a month, that's more, that, for a year, that would have been more than the tax credit that I would have gotten from John right. McCain. Right, Just to COBRA. Right. You know, granted, I was able on the individual market to find health insurance cheaper than that because I'm a relatively young woman in relatively good health, um, you know, because my, the birth defect that I have isn't considered a long-term one so that I would have to pay more or pay a premium to have one. Great. So I was able to get cheaper as long as I promise that I don't get pregnant. If I get pregnant, all my prenatal care is on me personally, which is right. not a great thing if I were, say, married no. or in a position to get pregnant. But, you know, great. So McCain's tax credit would work for me because I'm self-employed. I understand, though, a year ago when I was laid off, you know, if I had had to COBRA and that was what I was relying on for my health insurance, I'd be paying almost $500 a month. That's six grand. That'd be a grand in health insurance costs that I would be eating every year under McCain's tax credit, assuming, of course, that I was paying taxes in the first place. Right. And in which case, if I wasn't, which, you know, if I made under, you know, $45,000 a year, I wouldn't be paying federal income taxes. So then I'd be eating the whole six grand. Right. You know, so that's not a good thing. I think, you know, for me to say this in, in this time period that I have is great. I think the way that Joe Biden said it last night where he said the average family pays you know, or is paid in effect by their employer twelve thousand dollars a year for health insurance. Right. You put and that. You put those family in the private market. Give them a five thousand dollar tax credit. Where are they going to cop with the other seven? Or what are they going to do? Right. And no, what's the answer that's that true. is? I mean, I, that was that was the best explanation I'd heard in that sort of short form format that I think was really understandable to Americans. What the problem is? I mean, I can. I can talk forever about what the problems are, but no, you know, I, I get really wonky about it, and no one necessarily understands that. I think, you know, f- for him to have said that was the first time I think a lot of, you know, if Americans were still paying attention at that point, which I think is, they were, is I, th- I think they were, um, you know, I, I think I, I think that you're right. I think that I was, you know, I I sort of I always want more than there is, and if I get more, then other people aren't going to enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I think that yeah. you're very right in saying this is about what. We could handle. I actually thought last night's debate was very lively. It was very engaging, um, possibly more so than the presidential one, in which you know McCain seemed to refuse to make eye contact with, with Obama or acknowledge his presence on the stage. Um, yeah, I thought last night, whatever, um, whatever else you want to say about it, there was it. It was a very digestible, watchable, engaging hour and a half. No, I, I think it was. I mean, I, I think the problem with the first one is, you know, they got so into the weeds on foreign policy and yes. such long-form answers that, I mean, I, I you know, I have a master's degree in it, and I started to lose focus. And it's my job not only to pay attention, but supposedly I have an intellectual interest in the issues, and I was starting to lose the thread of what was going on. So that was, I mean, I think that was very hard for a lot of Americans to digest. I think you're right about last night's debate. I just... You know, 90 minutes is 90 minutes is a long debate, and I think it's important to have the 90 minutes. I just wonder how many people stuck stuck through to see, you know, the bits that that I thought were really important to get out there in terms of where their differences are. You know, and I, I and I frankly think that that on healthcare, you know, healthcare is one of those issues that re- Republicans in Congress t- a year ago were was really afraid of. Like Republican districts were polling 60 percent in favor of universal health care in, in favor of Hillary care it was this am- is sort of amazing reversal where the country started to realize that they were screwed right. right and you know and Republicans are afraid of this issue and Republicans don't want to talk about this issue and so I, I actually wonder why the Obama campaign hasn't been 
more effective at saying this is what McCain wants to do to you. They want to. They don't just want you to get a tax credit. This isn't about a tax credit. This is about taking away the health care that you have had for your entire adult life and changing it in such a way that you you will have to know more than you do now and pay more attention than you do now and pay more money than you do now. And this is what they want to do to health care so that the health insurance companies make more and health care brokers make more and your employer has to pay less. And you you get to shoulder that burden because they think the markets are going to work it out for you. Right. And if And if you do that, I think... People are going to look at the financial markets this week, and they're going to look at the mortgage markets, and they're going to look at what deregulation has, to a great degree, wrought in this country, and say, no, no, that's not what, we, that's not where we want healthcare to go. I don't want to turn this much control over to big business. And health, health insurance in this country is big business. These are the right. people who are going to cancer victims and saying, you know what? Now that your cancer's in remission, even though you have a 90% chance of it coming out of remission, we're not really, we don't want to cover you anymore. It's right. it's just too expensive. You know, you, you used your insurance, and so we're not really going to keep you on it. So enjoy. Have a nice life. We're pretty sure, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, they might pick you up. You could try getting a job, but pre-existing condition, they're not going to cover it. So have a nice life or not since you have cancer and you're going to die. Right. Well, you this know. is this is something that's interesting. Your talk about how uh, the sort of reversal of national and, in a sense, bipartisan feeling on some of these issues. I mean, when you think about the fact that, you know, what is it, 14 years ago, Newt Gingrich basically led a revolution against Bill Clinton based on Hillary's idea for health care that pretty much now, um, you know, people accept as, as at least the beginnings of a pretty good idea. Um, and people on both sides of the aisle are, as you say, are... Um, are sort of warming up to the fact that this is a necessary issue. I also was struck last night by the conversation about global warming as another one of those old sort of um, uh, liberal issues that, you know, got so much derision and now Republicans understand that they have to at least talk about caring about it and doing something about it. Um, I was really struck by that. I was also struck by the way that Biden and Palin both answered the questions on, on gay marriage and partnership benefits. Um, did either did did either of those things strike you as as worth talking about? Either the the answers on global warming or the gay marriage questions. I mean, you know, on a on a on a sort of a personal level, the gay marriage stuff is, is sort of more intellectually interesting to me. I mean, I think on global warming, the, sort of the difficulty with with Sarah Palin and and her her candidacy in terms of the McCain campaign is. Global warming's been an issue on which McCain really hasn't been that bad. I mean, right. he's been one of the people talking about cap and trade. He's been one of the people... I mean, it is actually one of the issues on which he's been a maverick. And so, hilariously, he gets this other maverick who's completely un on this issue, <laughs> and we'll see how many times I can say maverick in one sentence. <laughs> and, you know, so you have someone who is actually, you know, been outside of the Republican norms on this issue for, for a while. I mean, not... Not in the outdoor direction, not like in a great way, but in a very small way, in a very kind of Lieberman-esque kind of way, <laughs> then in a place where Republicans, I think, really need to get as a party about global warming and stop telling, you know, Americans who, frankly, most people aren't really buying it anymore. It's more, it, the problem is not that Americans don't believe that we're impacting global warming. I think there's a consensus among the biggest SUV drivers that we're impacting the climate. The difficulty is, what will you? What do you want to do about it? What will you do about it? And I think most Americans are, are kind of like, well, someone else should do something about it. And and that's, I mean, that's you know, that's sort of the genius of of sort of where McCain has been is hitting on the, what the other somebody should do. I think, you know, to say, you know, to be in this sort of denial, well, it has some impact, but it's like, you know, this threat. It's just the new ice age, and you know, but it'll be millions of years from now. We don't really have to worry about it. I mean, I just, I don't think the electorate buys that anymore. I don't, you know, I think if people bought it, you know, Hurricane Ike and Hurricane Gustav and Hurricane Katrina and, and all of these sort of big events, these sort of like once in a lifetime hurricanes coming up all at once, people are starting to go, maybe there is something to this crazy climate change thing. Well, I was amazed by that. Palin's answer on that was one I thought of her uh, patchwork answers where like the coaching really showed because I think she's been trying to, I think she's been coached up on that do you know what I mean like yeah. I think she's been coached up to sort of come closer to McCain on it as you you know um, but there's also this crazy town patchwork about it because she gets to say I'm in a I'm in an Arctic state and so I feel it more that well of course she actually does this is actually this is one of the ironies of the of the of Palin 
and her presence on the presidential stage is that, of course, it is her state that feels it as much as anybody else, you know? And, and yet she's somebody who has said until very recently, you know, that global warming was not man-made, that, but, and so here she is in this position where on a debate stage, she has to mix all of those factors together. And it was one of those absolutely nutty answers where she was like, I'm from the state where you can really feel it. It's real. It's not man-made. The causes don't matter. We should cap emissions. And it was like, what? Did you just give seven different answers rolled into one? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was, I mean, that was where you could really see that, like, having, I don't know if you've ever done, like, debate club, but, like, where yeah. you basically lined your note cards up and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six. And, you know, never and mind you that two and four, never mind that two and four <laughs> contradict each other. I, it's not man-made. We should cap emissions. What? <laughs> Wait, then. Okay. Wait, that was, yeah. It was like a little like, oh, okay, well, it, okay, both ways, that's fine. Uh, it, it, if it but, makes sense to Americans, great. If it gets us to, like, emissions caps, fine. Like, but even the argument that, even the argument that it doesn't matter, which she also made to Katie Couric last week, that it doesn't matter. Oh, well, we shouldn't worry too much about what caused it. Because um, we we'll need to. Do, huh? Yeah, but then we should cap emissions. Cause, but yeah. Not that we should worry about what caused it, but we should probably cap emissions. I mean, well, you know, and, and, and it would be a great place for the Obama campaign and for Biden to have really hit her on this idea that as a maverick governor, she maverickly, you know, magically went after the oil companies, who they're all nice people, and I'm sure they, you know, God bless their hearts, I think she said. Yes. But, God. you know, I really had to go after them. Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's have a moment of honesty here. Why do you believe, let me believe, that... Um, that global warming isn't man-made. Well, you believe it because you come from an oil-producing state, which, right. you know, gives back, you know, money from the Alaska Permanent Fund, you know, to its residents. So you can't get rid of that. You know, you need to keep doing oil. You need people to keep using oil. Like, right. it's great to say you're all minimalist maverick against the oil company interests, but at the end of the day, when you're talking about how there's no such thing as global war, or not that there's no such thing, but that it's not man-made, you know, and we don't need to do anything about, say, car emissions to deal with it, um... You know what? What? What is it that you're? What is that that you're saying? I mean, right. you're basically saying I'm tied to the oil companies, and right. that's that's one place where I think the Obama campaign really hasn't hit her. You know, you look at like the 25 grand in gifts that she received that were all sort of disclosed last week. A lot of those were from oil company interests. Right. Like, you know, she can say that they're just doing it because she's nice, but in reality, like, you know, as the governor of Texas has to be, you know, up on with the oil companies, so does the governor of Alaska, so does the governor of California to a great degree. I mean, these are these are oil-producing states, and they're not going to do stuff that is, you know, this huge source of income and jobs for their economy. So it's great, you know, like, the whole, like, I'm a maverick because of my, the way that I deal with the oil companies. Well, no, you're a maverick because of the way you dealt with Vico, and the way that you dealt with the senators in your own party, who you probably didn't like anyway, who were all corrupt, and you got rid of them. Great. Right. right. Good on you. You should have done it. I right. totally, completely need it. That does not mean that you don't get along with the oil companies. Right. At all. Um, I think we have to wrap it up in a second. There is one other... I, I have one moderately positive thing to say about Sarah Palin. And I want to... You know, there's that Rachel Maddow section, Talk Me Down. Okay, so go I'm, ahead. I'm sort of anxious for you to talk me down from this. Because this was what okay. I would say would be the one positive reaction I had to anything that happened last night. Um, to, to Palin, I mean, um, would be the gay marriage question. And here was my take on it. Because it was the initial question was about um, partnership benefits. Do you support partnership benefits for gay couples? And um, what I was struck by, both Joe Biden and Sarah Palin agreed that they do not support gay marriage. Um, but this is what I felt, that considering... The world and the and the voters whom Palin is there to represent, um, conservative, Christian, evangelical, often homophobic and, in, and often an, in, an intolerant and homophobic base, that her answer was warmer um, toward the idea of tolerance and acceptance of homosexuality and um, love and and partnership between people of the same sex, given the base that she is there representing, then that, that in a sense, um, I was I was more surprised by the openness of her answer, not that it was a positive one. Um, more surprised in a good way by that than I was by once again having to hear a Democratic candidate talk about how marriage should just be 
between a man and a woman. I mean, this is, you know, this is, again, me being over-idealistic about what it's possible for people to say, but there is perhaps nothing that um, enrages me as much as having a field of Democratic candidates, none of whom, oh, except for, I think, Dennis Kucinich, could say... I believe that gay people should have all of the all of the benefits and all of the civil rights and all of the and everything that's available to heterosexual people. I mean, this you is you got to give props to Mike Gravel. Mike Gravel said the same thing. Oh, Mike Gravel and Dennis Kucinich are pro-gay marriage. Right. I mean, this the fact that the fact that nobody <laughs> representing <laughs> what whatever you, I mean, I know calling it the American left is even inaccurate. But but to me. I, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? There was no, something no, almost funny. more positive about what Palin was able to say, given who she was representing, than what Joe Biden was able to say, given who he's representing. Well, and, I mean, the difficulty is, is that Joe Biden is, of course, trying, I mean, he's trying to appeal to the center that has a right. lot of sort of difficulty with this idea. I think Sarah Palin, I mean, for one, let's just acknowledge here that the McCain camp, there's a lot of log, a lot of log cabin Republicans in the McCain camp. He's the first time they've given, you know, their endorsement to the Republican presidential candidate because they didn't do it for George Bush. You know, there is a lot of tacit tolerance of homosexuality within the McCain camp. And so I think to a great degree, Sarah Palin's answer about tolerance of the people who are homosexual was a good one. I think... You know, if you really looked at how she answered the question about civil rights and how she really answered the question about extending partnership benefits, I think that was actually a completely negative answer because you have a governor of a state who didn't veto this great bill that extended domestic partnerships in much of the way, I mean, and and beat New York out in doing it, for instance. Beat, you know, certainly beat out a state like Virginia, which is like eliminating the ability of, of. you know, unmarried couples, gay or straight, to sign contracts to eliminate the possibility that, you know, any contract gay people could sign could eventually approach marriage. Um, But that said, one said, well, would you support within the administration the extension of domestic partnership benefits to, you know, to gay couples on on a federal level? She said no. Right. I mean, she, she said... You know, while I'm all for tolerance, and I, and I and I don't think you should be allowed to discriminate against gay people if you want if they want to be hired or get housing, I don't think that should be enshrined in law, and I don't think that there should be domestic partnership benefits. And that I mean, those have real implications for, you know, not to get back to baby boomers because we aren't them, but for for you know, gay people of a certain age who are coming up on retirement, who have social security, who you know are going to need to get Medicare and going to need to get Medicaid and going to be looking for survivors' benefits and pensions and 401ks and all these things that, you know, are, are going to be really important to a, to a certain class of people now and, and, and a much larger class of people, I think, down the line. And, and the fact that even coming from a state where she acknowledged that this was a good thing and signed off on it, she couldn't get up on a federal on the, the national stage and say, you know what, I don't agree with marriage because marriage is a religious institution. It's, a, right. it's, it's an important institution to this country, but I don't think that... It's right either to say that two people that have committed 40 years of their lives to each other aren't in some way equal depending on their gender. You know, I I mean, I think it it would have provided a real opportunity to to stand up for something which she's already stood up for, and she she fell. So that's me talking. Well, that's me talking. You talked me down 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 on that. I want to just clarify that in no way did I did I did I mean to suggest that I thought her answer was adequate or good. I just was I just was merely talking about in comparison to what I. Feared it might be. Um, yes, that I would. I would agree with that. I mean, my my problem. I, I mean, I completely agree with you about the democratic response. I would like to see a major Democrat get up and say, you know what, this is stupid. Like we are the Democratic Party, and if you don't like gay people, that's fine. That doesn't mean that you are. Right. You know, don't marry one. Implic- I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> like. <laughs> But I mean, I mean, if you if you want to be intolerant, that's fine. Do it on your own time. Don't yeah. do it on the party's time. Don't do it in the election booth. You don't have to like hang out with them at the barber shop. You don't have to like go right. to Home Depot. You don't have to hold hands. We're not going to make you get gay married to someone. Right. We're the Democratic Party. We are the party of not interfering in people's relationships. We are the party of like privacy on these issues. And this is what we are going to do. So all the intolerant voices, just shut up. Keep it in the house. Same way you should be doing about racism. You know, right. if, if you have to be that way, fine, in the privacy of your own home, in the same way that I'm going to live my life in the privacy of my own home, you can live your little intolerant, homophobic, racist life in the privacy of yours, and we'll go all out together and pretend that everything is normal. And 
that, I mean, that's what I would like to see. That's what I would like to see the Democratic Party say to homophobes. That's what I'd like to see them say to racists. Like, that's fine. You want to be that way? I get to be gay or I get to be, right. you know, whatever. And you don't get to be a jerk about that. Right. I really don't think that would be, like, a hard message for the Democratic Party to take somewhere, but... Neither do I. And on that, I on that I, note, I think we should probably, on that, you know, I, yeah. I think we should probably sign off since we've gone <laughs> quite a bit over, I think, our allotted yes. time, but... Great. Well, it was great to finally meet you. Yes, you sort of. too. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll do it again sometime soon. Yes, I hope so. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye, Megan. Bye.